This video is brought to you by friend of the channel Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about them as well as a special offer they're making available through my channel. Sorry, just one sec. Come on. Come on. One more hit. Yes. Take that, rat. Gamers. Sorry about that. I was just playing some Elden Ring on my brand new Steam Deck. That's right, nerds. Your boy is basically the only person in Australia that has one of these bad boys. You won't believe what I had to do to Gaben to get it. It is not a story I can repeat on any website that does not end with the word hub. I was fortunate enough to have received a review unit of the coveted deck and I've been putting it through its paces these past few days. I'll likely do a proper review on it in a few weeks time once I've thoroughly tested it. But let me tell you straight off the top, this thing rules. And I can't believe that Valve have managed to cram this much tech into so small an item for so small a price. This is a genuine game changer for real and I'm really pumped to talk about it more over the coming weeks and months. Speaking of crammed, man, this is one hell of a chunky episode. Between news, announcements, releases, and sort of free stuff, this is one of the beefiest This Week in Video Games episodes yet. I love it when that happens. Austin, not so much, because he has to edit it all together. One like equals one prayer for Austin. Good luck, my dude. You're gonna need it. Let's get to the news. Okay, so let's start with that juicy COD news. During Microsoft's recent acquisition of Activision Blizzard, there was a lot of talk about potential changes to the way Call of Duty would be developed and shipped. These talks were happening prior to the acquisition due to the poor reception of last year's Vanguard, but also because of how diversified the COD portfolio has become between the persistent Call of Duty Warzone Battle Royale product and the wildly successful Call of Duty Mobile, eating into the market share typically reserved for mainline COD games. These discussions intensified with the acquisition, however, as both pundits and developers were hopeful that Microsoft's deeper pockets might give the COD studio some breathing room, allowing them to slow down their release cadence and focus on, you know, making a game that people actually want to play rather than forcing out an annual release to keep shareholders happy. Things got a lot more interesting this week as Jason Schreier of Bloomberg reported Activision Blizzard are in fact planning to delay next year's Call of Duty, the first time such a delay would have occurred in nearly two decades. Schreier reports that the decision is not related to the recent Microsoft acquisition, which is likely true since Microsoft don't even own Activision Blizzard yet and wouldn't be able to have a say in a decision like this. This year's Call of Duty Modern Warfare sequel will still be releasing as per usual and Warzone 2 will likely ship next year which will surely go a long way toward filling the gaps since Warzone does very well for itself. Still this is a very big deal even when Call of Duty significantly underperforms it still absolutely trounces basically every other video game on the market not called FIFA or Grand Theft Auto 5. COD is an institution as much as it is a video game at this point and it's going to be at least a little bit weird to see an October or November roll through without a new Call of Duty game to dunk on. Speaking of dunks and Activision Blizzard, did you guys see the DICE Awards? Check out this clip. Since this is a formal event being broadcast to audiences across the world, I'm only going to say F Bobby Kotick. I'm just kidding, fuck Bobby Kotick, you come on! Now that is how it's done. Nice work, Greg. While Call of Duty is getting delayed, another title seems to be well and truly on track, the next Dragon Age game. This week, Bioware put out a blog posting telling everyone that Dragon Age was now in mid-production, which is a pretty big piece of news since it's clear that the game has emerged from pre-production, has crossed a bunch of milestones, and isn't that far off. With language like that, there's no way the title ships this year, but 2023 is looking pretty likely at this point. The blog post would go on to say, quote, the blueprint for the game is well understood and the team is focused, end quote, an obvious callback to one of the primary issues that undid Anthem, since postmortems of that game's development revealed that Bioware staff had no idea what the hell they were making until they saw a trailer for it at E3, and even then they were still confused. It's nice to see that Bioware are addressing this one head-on, and as a Dragon Age fan, I'm really hopeful that Bioware can land this one. Alright, so I think we should talk about Ukraine now. So listen, I understand that many of you choose video games or gaming content as a means of escapism, shutting out the rest of the world and you don't really want to hear about a war when you're tuning in for your weekly gaming news hot takes. I get that. It's just that I personally am not subscribed to that viewpoint. Video games are something that help us escape the real world, but the people who make video games exist in the real world and some of them exist in Ukraine and other nearby countries and territories, so I think I'd be doing them a disservice if I didn't talk about this stuff and just focused on Elden Ring memes. With that said, Vladimir Putin's unjust, bloody invasion of Ukraine is a tragedy, and I very much hope that the Ukrainian people and their allies prevail. It's been inspiring to see the bravery of President Zelensky as he takes to the front line to defend his people, and in our little corner of the universe, it's been inspiring to see the way that Ukrainian game developers have remained strong and defiant, and the way that the broader games community has stood up to to support Ukraine. 
You might already be aware that Stalker developer GSC are themselves Ukrainian based, and they issued a statement on Steam saying, quote, Our country woke up with the sounds of explosions and weapons fire, but it's ready to defend its freedom and independence, for it remains strong and ready for anything. The future is unknown, but we hope for the best, are ever sure of our armed forces and our belief in Ukraine, end quote. They provided a link where you can donate money to the armed forces of Ukraine. I'll leave a link to that below. Other developers such as Ubisoft, Raw Fury, Frogworks, and CD Projekt Red all issued statements in support of Ukraine, with developer 11-Bit Studios, makers of This War of Mine, saying they'll donate all proceeds from the sale of their game and its DLC for the next seven days to the Ukrainian Red Cross. As the global financial system responds to the invasion, freezing Russian assets assets and cutting off access to crucial payment platforms, Russian games developers find themselves in a position of not being able to receive payments from Steam, effectively freezing them out of any and all revenue from their games. World of Tanks developer Wargaming is based in Belarus, and this week they sacked their long-standing creative director Sergei Berkotovsky, who voiced support for the Russian invasion in a now-deleted Facebook post. The studio has a number of staff members based in Kiev and issued a statement disavowing Berkotovsky's statement, calling it, quote, his personal opinion, which categorically does not coincide with the position of the company, end quote. Sadly, this is likely to be a long, drawn-out conflict, and while it isn't my job to report on the conflict itself, I don't think I'm doing my job properly if I don't talk about how this is affecting the way people make and play games. It's obviously a very tiny part of a much more important discussion. Conflicts like these certainly put into perspective many of the things I talk about on this channel. But as the largest entertainment medium in the world, I do think that video games and the video games industry has at least some power to affect change. And I'm sure we're going to see more examples of game makers and publishers doing what they can to support the people of Ukraine. Alright, so we're all pretty bummed out after that one. I get it. Let's do something we all enjoy make fun of Konami. For years and years now, fans have been begging Konami to do anything with the Silent Hill franchise. And while Konami have finally gotten around to outsourcing the IP to a bunch of developers, it seems they didn't get around to renewing the Silent Hill website domain. So someone else bought it, and now they're using it to troll Konami. God bless this person. The domain ownership lapsed last week and was purchased by someone for nearly 10 grand. They've kept it classy though. The only thing they've put up there is a JPEG of an old tweet from Silent Hill 2 art director Masahiro Ito, who recently tweeted out, quote, I wish I hadn't designed fucking Pyramid Head, end quote, lamenting the fact that the iconic design would later go on to be so reused across the franchise. With future Silent Hill games confirmed, it remains to be seen if Konami will pony up the dough to re-secure the domain, but I'm guessing they'll probably just sue this person since that's totally something Konami would do. I hope this person is super cashed up with fuck you money and like takes the matter to court and then they make a movie out of it with like Jonah Hill or something. I don't know, that'd be cool. Good news VR fans, we got our first ever look at the PSVR 2 this week. The images were posted to Sony's blog and showcased both the headset and the controllers, which are actual controllers this time around instead of those awful move sticks. The unit looks great, very similar to the PS5 but with a more rounded feel. That's deliberate according to Sony. I love this quote, this is peak design speak, get ready. Quote, the PS5 console has flat edges as it's meant to be displayed on a flat surface. While there was more emphasis on adding roundness to the design of the PSVR 2 headset, since it's meant to have constant human contact, similar to the rounded edges of the DualSense controller and the Pulse 3D headset, end quote. All right, man, if you say so. Constant human contact? Jeez, what kind of a relationship are you imagining we have? Ah, uh, VR, yeah, right, okay, sure. The PSVR 2 won't necessarily herald the next generation of VR, but it looks like it's gonna be a big step up in the current generation of VR, with its 4K HDR screens, its haptic feedback, and its single cord setup all being a nice bump over what the previous headset offered. No release date on this one yet, but it's very reasonable to expect it late this year, if not definitely 2023. Here's a headline that both bums me out and worries me greatly. Square Enix say that Guardians of the Galaxy did not meet expectations. So, some background. This story all begins with Marvel's Avengers. So that releases and everyone's like, whoa, that sucks, big time, and no one buys it. Square Enix takes a $60 million bath on that project owing to the licensing and development costs. After that, Square Enix announces Guardians of the Galaxy at E3 last year and everyone's like, well, Avengers sucked, so clearly that's gonna suck too. Hype for the game was basically non-existent pre-launch and then it comes out and it fucking rules. For real, Guardians of the Galaxy was one of the best games of 2021 and easily one of the best licensed games ever made. 
Everyone who played it loved it, but it seems as though the number of people who played it remained small, or at least smaller than Square Enix would have liked. In a recent earnings call, Square Enix said, quote, Despite strong reviews, the game's sales on launch undershot our initial expectations, end quote. This bums me out because I hate seeing amazing games not selling through the roof, and yeah, I believe Square Enix when they say that this did not sell well because Steam Charts put the max concurrent play account at just shy of 10,000 people, when even Marvel's Avengers was able to hit nearly 30,000. This also worries me because I really, really want a sequel for this game, and if it didn't sell well in the first instance, then Square Enix are going to be less likely to make a sequel happen. If only there was a subscription service that Guardians of the Galaxy could move to, allowing people to experience this amazing game for themselves at a low price and contribute to a groundswell of positive sentiment that could one day lead to a sequel. More on that in this week's Sort of Free Stuff segment. A quick bit of rumor mongering now, we might be getting a lineup of LEGO sports games courtesy of 2K. The scoop comes from Video Game Chronicle, who claim to have sources saying that the publisher has signed a new multi-game partnership with LEGO ahead of the expiration of the exclusive deal currently in effect with Warner Brothers and TT Games. Apparently, the game will be made by Sumo Digital and will kick off with a soccer game. Get it? Kick off. Anyway, there's apparently a racing game after that, plus some stuff still under wraps. All of this is part of 2K's strategy to grow their sports portfolio and LEGO's strategy to broaden its games portfolio, which has done super well under the stewardship of TT Games, but now it seems as though LEGO are like, sorry TT, I think it's time we see other people. We should be getting that soccer game sometime this year in addition to the LEGO Skywalker Saga coming in April. A big year for LEGO games and a big year for LEGO in general. I mean, did you guys see that Horizon Zero Dawn tall neck they're putting out? I haven't bought LEGO since I was a kid, but I am buying that. Trust me. One other rumor which I'll bring to your attention comes courtesy of reliable insider Jeff Grubb, who when speaking on the Grubb Snacks podcast said that various people, the powers that be, the Illuminati, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, they're turning their gaze to something and it's going to make a bunch of people very happy. Fallout New Vegas 2. With Microsoft now owning Obsidian and Bethesda, Microsoft has the power to grab both of them by the scruff of the neck and say, Now Kith. Grubb says, quote, This is very early, but people have begun to have talks and say these words in sentences, and those words are Obsidian and New Vegas 2. We're talking years and years away. There's at least an interest and conversations happening about making something like that actually a reality, end quote. Fallout New Vegas is regarded by many as the best Fallout, even though it was janky as all hell as a result of a super truncated development timeline, with Bethesda very busy with both Starfield and then Elder Scrolls 6 for the next, I don't know, five to seven years. It makes sense that someone within Microsoft's vast empire of studios should make a Fallout game, and who better than Obsidian? I hope this one turns out to be true. I suspect that it is. Finally, let's finish up on some Gaben news because Gaben rules. With the Steam Deck releasing this week, Gabe took to the interview circuit where he provided his perspective on the state of the games industry and where it's at. Subscription services came up as a topic where Gabe confirmed that Valve had no plans for a Game Pass style competitor, but they'd be open to bringing Game Pass to Steam. Unsurprising, since that would mean that Valve would claim 30% of the subscription revenue, something I'm sure Microsoft isn't all that interested in. The conversation also steered towards the metaverse, a topic that Gabe had some piercing insight into. Quote, There's a bunch of get-rich-quick schemes around metaverse. Most of the people who are talking about metaverse have absolutely no idea what they're talking about, and they apparently have never played an MMO. They're like, oh, you'll have this customizable avatar, and it's like, well... Go into Lanosia in Final Fantasy XIV and tell me this isn't a solved problem from a decade ago. Not some fabulous thing that you're, you know, inventing, end quote. Like I said, Gabe rules. To cap things off, Gabe also provided some information on why Steam banned any game using crypto or NFT, saying, quote, That's sort of where we're at with the blockchain NFT-based stuff. So much of it was ripping customers off. And we were like, yeah, that's not what we want to do. We don't want to enable screwing large numbers of our customers over. So that's what drove that decision. There's nothing inherently about distributed ledgers that make them problematic. It's just so far, that's almost always what our experience has been, end quote. Like I said, Gabe rules. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, a few quick things. Young Souls is an indie 2D beat-em-up that can be played co-op, which is nice. That got a release date trailer. It's hitting all platforms on March 10th and will be a day one Game Pass release. Back for Blood is getting a major DLC update on April 12th. 
It's called the Tunnels of Terror and it'll add new enemies to kill, new cleaners to do the killing, a new PvE activity and the regular cosmetics you can expect to accompany any seasonal update. The Ascent was one of my favorite games of last year when it arrived exclusive to Xbox and PC. It's an isometric twin stick shooter with some brilliant visuals and sound design and some very solid action to boot. It's now coming to PlayStation. Well, not now, now, more like March 24th, but that's still pretty soon. And I definitely recommend you Sony ponies take a look. Biggest announcement for the week was the reveal of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet releasing this year, making for two major Pokemon game releases in a single year since we had Arceus in January. This does seem to harken toward the more classic formula rather than the innovation brought by Arceus, but it's likely that some of that will transfer across, particularly as it relates to world design. Visually, the game is looking like an improvement on Arceus, but it's still not exactly Breath of the Wild or anything. The Switch isn't a powerful machine by any metric, but you get the feeling that the hardware looks at what Game Freak produces and says, come on bro, you're making me look bad. Anyway, no further details on this one yet, but be sure to look forward to leaks and lawsuits over the coming months. So what came out last week? Well, you might recall that last week was pretty much the most stacked week in what was the most stacked February of all time. So yeah, a few things came out. Let's start with the smaller stuff first. Grid Legends arrived on a bunch of platforms and despite the fact that it's not called Forza or Gran Turismo, it's still done fairly well for itself. The game currently sits at a strong 77 on Open Critic and a mostly positive 73 on Steam. General consensus is that this is a solid racing entry worthy of the Codemasters pedigree, but that it isn't an essential pickup if you're already being well serviced by alternatives. Luke Riley is IGN's racing specialist and he rated the game a 7 saying, quote, Grid Legends is a sure step up from Grid 2019, but it's definitely treading water in some core areas, end quote. While Games Radar scored it a 4 out of 5 saying, quote, Grid Legends finds its niche alongside Forza Horizon and Gran Turismo, offering track-based thrills for all skill levels, end quote. Martha is Dead hit PC, Xbox, and PlayStation last week, with the PlayStation version of the title being censored. Turns out that was due to some very graphic content. Still, that's no excuse for Sony to pull that bullshit. The game has met okay reviews, not vastly different in score to what Grid Legends achieved, for example, but the tone of the reviews was much different. God is a Geek scored at 7.5 saying, quote, Martha is Dead deals with losing loved ones and losing your own self through a powerful narrative that can be quite uncomfortable at times, end quote. While Press Start were pretty brutal, scoring the game a 4 out of 10 saying, quote, while I enjoyed a fraction of my time exploring Martha is Dead's gorgeous Tuscan farmlands, the thing I'm most thankful for is how mercifully short the game is. End quote. Unlikely to end up as a box quote in the next phase of the game's marketing, but there it is. Former small indie dev turned Sony pony Bungie released the latest Destiny 2 expansion last week. It's called The Witch Queen and it takes you to new locations to do battle with a tricksy hive god who happens to be the sister of Oryx, the Taken King. Remember him? I'll admit, I have not dumped a ton of hours into The Witch Queen yet, owing to the fact that I am just super burned out after the previous month of smashing game after game. Still, I have finished the campaign on the newly added Legendary difficulty, and I can confirm that it is excellent, easily the best, most playable Destiny campaign experience that Bungie has delivered us. Outside of the campaign, I'm not gonna lie, there's just some things, a lot of things in fact, that I'm not vibing with at this point. Maybe that'll change, I don't know. I'm gonna put a good 60 to 70 hours into it over the next two weeks ahead of my review. But yeah, remember that old Facebook status? It's complicated. That pretty much sums up my entire relationship with Destiny, but it certainly sums up my relationship with Witch Queen, at least so far. Like I said, review out next week after I've done the raid and have well and truly spanked all the content this expansion has to offer. If you'd like to know the minute that review goes live, then be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Easy. All right, let's talk Elden Ring because this one's a bit of a bummer, unfortunately. So the reviews for Elden Ring went up last week and I have to say that even though I knew this game was extraordinary, I was still blown away by these reviews. Elden Ring sits at 97 on Metacritic, putting it just two points behind Ocarina of Time and one point behind Tony Hawk 2, Soul Calibur and Grand Theft Auto 4. On Open Critic, Elden Ring sits at 96, just one point behind the top spot holder, Mario Odyssey. And let's be clear, Elden Ring is a much better video game than Mario Odyssey. No shade to Mario, but Odyssey was hardly his finest hour. I very strongly recommended Elden Ring. The first time I've done so for any game since I've adopted this pseudo scoring system, Elden Ring is an all timer. The combination of decades of work from FromSoft who have relentlessly perfected their Soulsborne formula and who now apply their genius to the challenge of open world game design. Design which for a long time now has been going in the wrong direction as open worlds become increasingly bloated and signposted. Elden Ring is the answer to all of that. 
while being the best Souls-like I've played, while also being one of the deepest, most flexible action RPGs I've ever played. It is genuinely remarkable, and I was very excited to put my review out for this one because I love spreading the good word about amazing games. Negativity gets clicks, sure, but that's not what I like doing. I like showing you guys stuff that I love in the hope that you'll love it too. So here's the thing though. Turns out Elden Ring runs like ass for a whole bunch of people when it ran really, really well for me. I covered performance extensively during my review and commented that I experienced only the most minor of performance issues and bugs, and that is the experience of a lot of people currently playing the game. At the same time, a huge chunk of people are getting horrendous performance, with terrible stuttering, massive frame drops, blue screens, issues with controller support and more. The console ports are not immune to this, suffering from shaky frame rates to the point where the best console performance is to be found by running the PS4 version of the game on the PS5. That is super shitty, no two ways about it. Of course, this will eventually get patched someday, but for now it is a massive red flag and a real shame to see a game so wonderful undermined by these issues. I still do very strongly recommend Elden Ring because it is a phenomenal video game, but sadly, I have to also recommend that you hold off on a purchase until some performance patches roll through. So what's coming out this week? Well, March doesn't have the number of haymakers that February did, but it does make up for that with a string of jabs that will knock you out if you're not careful. Kicking things off is unlikely sequel Elix 2. I say unlikely sequel because the first one wasn't exactly a home run with critics or even a lot of players, but the people that liked it really, really liked it. It was obviously enough support to greenlight the sequel, which has been in development for a number of years and arrives today on all platforms but the Switch. I'm informed that this is around 60 hours to play through, so if you have any spare time between Dying Light 2, Horizon Forbidden West, Witch Queen, and Elden Ring, then I need some of the drugs you're taking because February has broken me and the thought of playing through another 60 hour game right now is enough to give me the shakes. Here's one I will try to make time for this month though, Shadow Warrior 3. Published by Devolver Digital and hitting both last-gen consoles and PC today, Shadow Warrior 3 looks to be a big, big jump over its predecessor in terms of presentation at the very least. This thing really does look awesome, and just straight up fun, I've really admired how deep and carefully balanced so many of February's biggest games were, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't looking forward to a nice palate cleanser where I just get to run around blowing shit up. Shadow Warrior 3 looks to be exactly what the doctor ordered. Far Changing Tides is the sequel to Far Lone Shore, a 2D side-scrolling visual-led experience that's very much about just soaking up the vibe and the views. This one had an early review embargo, actually, and critics are loving it. It's sitting at 82 on Open Critic right now. Game Informer scored it an 8.3, saying, quote, Far Changing Tides isn't an action-packed roller coaster ride. It's a contemplative journey that isn't afraid to slow down and ask you to reflect on your expedition. It's a journey I hope to take again someday, end quote. Far Changing Tides arrives on all platforms today. Babylon's Fall. Hmm, okay, so first up, the particulars. This is launching exclusive to PlayStation consoles and the PC on the 3rd. This is being developed by Platinum Games, who we all love, and so everyone was really excited about it at first. Back then, it was being positioned as a single-player character action game, which is what everyone wants from this studio. Eventually, it was revealed that the focus of the title had pivoted towards being a co-op live service looter. Four words that are going to make your average Platinum fan throw up in their mouth a little. This game also got a pretty chunky visual downgrade, and it was revealed that it was borrowing art assets from Final Fantasy XIV. Not inherently a bad thing, except that the stuff they were borrowing looks kind of dated now since those assets were developed up to 10 years ago. Numerous technical tests have also defanged the hype beast, where feedback has been middling at best. This is a full price offering that kind of looks like it might sit more comfortably in the free-to-play pile but we can't say definitively until we get our hands on it. Hate to say it, but I'm not expecting great things from this one. Triangle Strategy feels like it kind of crept up on us, but it too is out this week. It arrives on the 4th, exclusive to the Nintendo Switch. This is a very classically inspired tactics-based JRPG. Not really my jam, but I hope it's good for those that are excited for it. The biggest release of the week is almost, like, not as big as I feel it should be. Gran Turismo 7 releases on the 4th, exclusive to the PS4 and 5. This is a real marquee entry in the series in a way that previous entries like GT Sport just weren't, and it feels like there should be more hype and fanfare for this one than there currently is. I remember those halcyon days of Gran Turismo 2 where the game towered over the racing genre and it was this cutting edge showcase of what video games were capable of. It does feel like the franchise has lost some of its luster over the years, particularly as Forza continues to hit home run after home run. So I'm hoping that Gran Turismo 7 is the return to center stage that is always nice to see for legacy franchises such as this. 
I do actually have a review code for this at the moment, but I'm currently working through Witch Queen, and so I've not even been able to boot it up yet. I'm sorry, racing fans. I'm sure it hurt to hear that. Finally, because my editor Austin threatened to resign unless I give it one last shout out, the Guild Wars 2 End of Dragons expansion launches today, or yesterday actually, since Austin, and this is a true story, requested time off so that he could play it. That is why this video is out on Wednesday instead of a regular Tuesday, so that Austin could play Guild Wars. You have him to thank for that, okay? But seriously though, I've taken many days off playing video games, so I was very happy to make that happen. The expansion is the first in five years for an MMO that has flown under the radar, but has always maintained a loyal player base, like Austin. It adds new subclasses for every class, tons of new stuff to do, gear to collect, turtles to mount. The update adds fishing. I can't understand how any MMO could have existed for this long without fishing. Feels like the first feature that gets added to an MMO, alongside like quests and weapons. I will not be playing this one for myself, but Austin will be doing nothing but that for the coming weeks, so I'm sure we can look forward to another editor's choice sometime soon. Put this on your radar. This is Deadlink, a game from Polish indie developer Grubby Entertainment. This is a newly formed studio that came together back in 2020 and have worked remotely the entire time. An increasingly common trend in game dev these days, particularly indie devs who can afford to be a little more agile. Their debut game, Deadlink, it just looks fucking cool. It's described as a cyberpunk FPS with roguelike elements. You don't play as a person as much as you're the ghost in a mechanized shell, a humanoid combat drone deployed for covert missions. But I don't think the robot was properly instructed on the strict definition of the word covert. Because if this is covert, then the Doomslayer is in line to be the next Solid Snake. This gameplay looks fast, meaty, frenetic, and fun. I'm really digging the art style actually, plenty of detail on weapons and enemies, while maintaining a very clean look on the environments so you can see what matters most, your targets. Not entirely sure what to expect from this one yet, but I've already well and truly seen enough to pique my interest. I've added it to my wishlist, and if you'd like to do the same, I'll leave a link to the Steam page below. Deadlink doesn't have a release date yet, but it'll hit early access sometime this year. Sort of free stuff time, and whoa, is it a massive week this week. Unsurprising, since the last week of the month is when all the announcements happen for next month's sort of free content. It also serves as your last chance to grab stuff, so be sure to grab your Twitch Prime games, your Games with Gold, and your PS Plus titles for the month before they're gone, even though last month wasn't the greatest month for most of those platforms. The March lineup is a low-key banger though, we'll do Epic first. Right now you can get the charming, time-shifting role-playing game Chris Tales, but on the 4th there'll be three new offerings. Two of them are kind of similar, Black Widow Recharged and Centipede Recharged. Not gonna lie, I've never heard of these before, but they're apparently retro-inspired shooters. They look fun, sure, but I suspect people won't be rushing out to download these ones. The other offering is the Dauntless Epic Slayer Kit, and yes, I know we all roll our eyes at free-to-play resource pack giveaways, but I'm just going to use this opportunity to say that Dauntless is actually pretty cool, and you should check it out if you're looking for a free-to-play Monster Hunter alternative. It's not as good as Monster Hunter, or at least it wasn't back when I played it, but it had lots of cool stuff going for it, and the game has only gotten better since then with huge amounts of new monsters and weapons added. If you've been meaning to check it out at some point, then perhaps Perhaps the resource pack will give you the nudge you've been waiting for. Alright Xbots, you're up. This month your Games with Gold lineup includes The Flame in the Flood, which is a roguelike river journey. Looks kind of nice to be honest. Street Power Soccer is in there for some cheap arcade sports thrills. Sacred 2, man that one takes me back a while. Those are really good times. And finally Spongebob Truth or Square, a wholesome jaunt in which Spongebob must retrace his happiest memories to rediscover his lost Krabby Patty secret formula. What's not to love? Overall, not a bad lineup, but I saved the best for last because this month's Xbox Game Pass lineup is absolutely off its leash. First up, you can now play Flight Sim through cloud. Now this is a big deal because a lot of people can't run Flight Sim on PC because the specs are just too demanding. Now you can play Flight Sim on a compact Presario. Remember those? Kentucky Route Zero is on there. Uh, okay, so this one was actually one of my games of the year a few years back, but it is absolutely not for everyone. It is a very weird postmodern art installation turned video game. It's a point and click adventure of sorts, but don't think Monkey Island. Think like an interactive Penguin classic or something. Very weird, but very good. Far Changing Tides arrives as a day one Game Pass release. Definitely didn't see that one coming. Same goes for Young Souls, that 2D beat em up I mentioned earlier. Also day one on Game Pass. Final Fantasy 13 Lightning Returns is in there, but be sure to play the other two first since this is the last game in the 13 trilogy. 
Ironic Game of the Year contender Lawnmower Simulator arrives for consoles, and to cap all of this off, Unironic Game of the Year contender Guardians of the Galaxy has also made the list. As I mentioned earlier, this title didn't exactly do the numbers that Square was hoping for, which really bums me out. So hopefully a second wind on Game Pass will be exactly what the execs need to greenlight a sequel for this bad boy. Guardians of the Galaxy may not have the most stellar combat, but basically every other part of the package is A+, particularly the story, characters, and character performances. This really is an absolutely superb video game, and if you haven't played it yet, then please, please, grab yourself a month of Game Pass just to play it. It's worth the $10 or whatever Microsoft are charging these days. Can you still get the like dollar Game Pass for a dollar thing? I don't know. Probably yes. Okay, Sony Ponies, interesting month for you guys actually. Some weird stuff in here that really breaks the mold. We'll do PS Plus first. This month, PS Plus subscribers can get their hands on Team Sonic Racing for PS4. Not bad. If Horizon's dinosaurs were a little too robotic for your taste, then perhaps Uncle Jim can interest you in Ark Survival Evolved, also for PS4. Your PS5 game for the month is the excellent Ghost Runner, a cyberpunk parkour experience that kind of picks up where Mirror's Edge left off. Great game, really recommend it. The last item is the Ghost of Tsushima Legends mode. Now this is the multiplayer side of Ghost of Tsushima, and I remember a while back Sucker Punch announcing that they were spitting this out as a standalone offering, separate from the main game, and I was like, why though? I mean, you get Legends for free when you buy Ghost of Tsushima, so what's this separate skew for? Now we know, it's to give away as part of PS Plus. Don't be cynical about this one though, as I've said in my review of it, this little spin-off game mode is legitimately better than most live service games that have launched in the last five years. It's got plenty of content, deep build diversity, in-game raid encounters, and the best part, no microtransactions. Good guy Sucker Punch. The monthly PS Now lineup isn't usually that exciting, but this month is a little different since it may signal the beginning of something big. The March lineup does contain more predictable offerings like Crisis Remastered and Relicta, but it also contains Shadow Warrior 3, which arrived as a day one offering, the very first time that Sony has secured a day one release as part of PS Now. This could be laying the foundations for what to expect from Project Spartacus, Sony's all but confirmed answer to Game Pass, which will likely launch over the coming months. I suspect the subscription service war that has engulfed the TV and movie scene is just about to get started here in the world of video games, with every gaming service trying to be the next Netflix or HBO, rather than the next Peacock or Paramount Plus. Paramount Plus, it's a mountain of entertainment. See? Still funny, never gets old. Finally, capping off what I think is the biggest week in sort of free stuff we've ever had, Twitch Prime. This month, Amazon Plus or Twitch Prime subscribers can get Madden 2022, which I believe is a football game, Surviving Mars, which is a colony management game, SteamWorld Quest, which is a card-based battler, and Crypto Against All Odds, which I believe is crypto propaganda, like how the US Army used to have a free Counter-Strike alternative to encourage people to enlist. Listen to this blurb. Take on the role of a cybersecurity expert in this tower defense game where players will fight against hackers and other blockchain threats set in this cypherpunk interactive fiction, end quote. I reckon the Winklevoss twins made this game, and I won't hear otherwise. While I may have been lucky enough to have received a Steam Deck this week, I do have one complaint. It wasn't hand-delivered to me by the man himself, Gaben, first of his name, King of the Gamers, Master of the PC Master Race, Father of Dragoons. Actually, his son's a paladin, and Gaben plays a white mage, so that doesn't really work. Anyway, point is, what could be more feel-good for this week's feel-good story of the week than seeing a bunch of nerds reacting to Gaben arriving at their front door to personally hand-deliver an autographed Steam Deck? Let's take a look. Hi. Oh my god. Are you Hello. Are you Hayden? Yes. Hi Hayden, I'm Gabe. Oh my god, hello. Hi. Hi. Are you Danny? I am. I can see that you are Gabe Newell. Here's your deck. My favorite was these dudes who didn't order a Steam Deck, didn't seem to know what it was that were being handed, and definitely didn't know who Gaben was. Imagine it's moving day, which is always the worst, and suddenly Gabe rocks up and hands you a free Steam Deck. It was nice to see this because Gaben is a cool dude. He plays and loves video games, and unlike most CEOs, he hasn't lost touch with people. He publishes his personal email address and encourages people to email him, and he says he actually reads every one of those emails, and I personally believe him. We're fortunate that the dude who rules over the PC kingdom isn't a dick, and it would be nice if other video game bosses took a leaf out of that book, but that's very unlikely. For every Gaben, there are like 20 Andy Wilsons. 
and I don't expect that ratio to change anytime soon. So we've made it to the end of what was a very chunky episode. I thank you for sticking with us, but there was a lot to cover this week and I didn't want to shortchange any of it. If you enjoyed the video, or even a small part of it, consider hitting the like button because that is a Chad move and I appreciate it. And if you want to hit that Giga Chad territory, then hit the subscribe button and ding the notification bell. I'm taking things easy while I settle into the Destiny grind and get ready for the review next week. But after that, plenty to look forward to. We've got uh, Stranger in Paradise, Tiny Tina's Wonderland, Ghostwire Tokyo, and Weird West. March won't be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with February, but there's still going to be some bangers to play and talk about, so that's what I'm going to do. I hope you'll join me. Thanks again, and I'll see you next week. I know a lot of you are interested in making content yourself, be that on YouTube or podcasting or streaming or writing or whatever, and depending on what you're doing, you may want to think about making a website. I mean, let's say you and your buddies want to start a new weekly podcast. It's pretty hard to break through relying on just the podcast algorithm alone. You probably want a website where you can showcase your cast and you can upload the VODs and you can link off to different podcast platforms and more. Hell, with Squarespace, you can even create a special members only area so you can provide additional content to your most loyal supporters and host discussions using their message board tool. Squarespace supports all of that and tons more and it's super easy to use. You don't need to know anything about building a website Site to use Squarespace. You just select from their huge range of professional looking templates, you customize it using their intuitive tools, you plug in the extra extensions you're looking for and voila, you've got yourself a website that you probably would have had to have paid like $10,000 or more for someone else to build and maintain. As I mentioned last year, Squarespace have re-signed the channel for another 12 months. I really appreciate that support, that's amazing. Squarespace are helping me turn my passion into a career, and that's what they do for a lot of people, because if you want to turn your passion into a career, then a website is typically a pretty great place to start. To get started, visit squarespace.com, and if you want to get serious about it, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up to get 10% off your purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it.